Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. If you were just tuning in, we just went over the NFL power rankings 32 to 1. In this segment, we go to our winners and losers in the NFL. Much like college football we did yesterday, we've got five winners and five losers in the NFL this week. We're going to start off with the winners, but before we get into that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Or if you are on YouTube, you can use that Super Chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Tuesday, November 12th. But like I was saying, we are going to start off with our winners in this week of the NFL. Week 10 winners. Again, five winners, five losers. Starting off with the winners here at number five, very simply, it's the MVP race. This was going to be a stacked race from the beginning. We did our midseason NFL MVP report earlier on in the season, or earlier on last week, I should say. We had three finalists. Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen. Josh Allen probably didn't have his best game, but Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson just played an absolute masterclass against each other. That was a beautiful game of football to watch for offense. Obviously, if you like defense, turn your eyes away. You don't want to watch that one. But as far as the MVP race goes, that is cinema right there. That is a clash of maybe the top two in the MVP race going at it. Went to Lamar Jackson. Is he going to win his third MVP second in a row? He might. He is playing out of his mind right now. That MVP race is going to be so much fun down the stretch, especially if the Bengals start winning games the way that he is playing. An extra shout out there to Jamar Chase. Not in the MVP race, but we're not going to get to him uh, for the rest of this segment. So, so shout out. 264 yards and three touchdowns. Not an easy thing to do. Shout out him. Our number four winner. It's going to go to the Chargers, but more specifically to the coaching staff for the Chargers. This is a Chargers team that came in with very little expectations. Obviously, we know that Harbaugh is a winner. He Everywhere he goes, they win. But this is a team that came in with the, with the mentality that we're going to run the ball. And they did that. They started off the season running the ball, running the ball, running the ball. They didn't get Justin Herbert involved in the offense. Justin Herbert, who in my opinion is a top five quarterback in the NFL. They have been able to see what this roster is made of, and not get stuck in their ways. Not get stuck in the, we're only going to run the ball, we're not going to let Justin Herbert sling it, and they've continued to be a run-first offense. That's fine. They deserve that. With the way that J.K. Dobbins is playing, they deserve to be in that run-first kind of mode. But it's also super important that they see, and I think they are, the value of a quarterback like Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert comes out, and he has one of the strongest arms, point blank period, in the NFL. Justin Herbert is a top-five quarterback in the NFL, and they're letting him go out there. That is a great change by the coaching staff, and it's really cool that they're able to notice these changes and make that difference uh, in the middle of the season. No, it doesn't, doesn't happen that often. Our number three winner is the Cardinals. More specifically, the Cardinals' defense. I, w I read this stat when we, did our, when we did our power rankings about the Cardinals, but they now have, in three of their four games on this four-game winning streak, not allowed a touchdown to the opposing team. That's insane. This is a Cardinals defense that I had ranked as one of the bottom five in the league heading into this heading into this season. And through the first six weeks, first six weeks of the season, I felt very justified in that rank. They didn't show me anything that made me think, you know what? I'm going to change my mind about this Cardinals defense. They couldn't, they, they had a couple games over there where they were able to step up a bit, but they never really showed me that, hey, this is a Cardinals team that I need to stop sleeping on as far as the defense goes. And then in this win streak, they have done what barely ever happens in the NFL. You barely ever hold teams without a touchdown anyway in the league, but to do it three out of four games, two games in a row against some solid opponents, the Bears, who, yes, they're struggling, but had, you know, a little bit of momentum uh, earlier on in the season. They did it against the Chargers a, a couple of weeks ago on Monday Night Football, and then, of course, they do it last week against 
Excuse me. And then, of course, they do it this week against the Jets, a Jets team that had a lot of momentum. This is a Jets team that was coming off of their biggest win in a very, very long time in their franchise. That was a huge, huge win for them, and they are just shut everything down. The Cardinals are the number three winner this week. Number two winner, it's the Chiefs. They keep finding ways to win, and I can't ignore it anymore. The Chiefs, not that I really was ignoring it, but that special teams for the Chiefs really stepped up. It hasn't been the usual suspects at the time. In the beginning of the year, we thought the offense was going to be great. They finally got some receivers. They were going to turn it around. The thing that kept them in games, kept them winning games, wasn't the offense. It was the defense, specifically that linebacker core. And that linebacker core, I still think, deserves a lot of love. It still deserves a little more love than I think it's getting because I think it's the best linebacker core in the league, and I think it's the best defense in the league. But special teams really stepped up huge. Obviously, we know all about kickers. Kickers are important, but the 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 special teams, the the amount of work that the Chiefs must put in at special teams, the amount of the amount of uh, film that they must watch to find the weakness in that Broncos offensive line and exploit it at the most opportune time. The Chiefs, great coaching. They keep finding ways to win games, and they're still undefeated. This is a scary Chiefs team. They're only going to get better. They're only going to get more healthy. And, I mean, come on. They're just really good at football, guys. The Chiefs are the number two winner this week, which puts us at number one. The number one winner, the team that made me change my opinion on them completely this week was the Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers came out there and showed me something I have not seen from them all season long, which is a competent offense. Against the Giants, a game that the, their last game that they won heading into the bye, the offense, while it still worked, was not very competent, if we're being fair. They had a re- punt return touchdown, and they didn't really get much more offensively. This was a huge performance by them. Russell Wilson, while he wasn't the most accurate, was able to to put the ball in harm's way without turning it over that much. And maybe that goes to point at how bad the commander's secondary has been, because it's been bad. Mike Williams scores his first touchdown as a Steeler in his first game. Congratulations. That is a huge get for them. George Pickens makes some of the most insane catches I've ever seen. And this is a Steelers team that is changing my mind. We all know about that defense, but the way that Russell Wilson is transforming that offense... This is a Steelers team that could be very dangerous, and they're the number one winner of the week. But let me know what you think. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we turn our attention to the losers this week in the NFL. The top five losers this week coming up in just one second here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Tuesday, November 12th. If you are just tuning in, we just finished going over the winners, the top five winners from the NFL in Week 10. A big week for a lot of teams. Bad teams got a lot of wins. Good teams got a lot of wins. The middle kind of suffered a lot in this one. But regardless of that, we're going to get to our top five losers of the week in just one second. But before we do, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Or if you are on YouTube, you can use that super chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Tuesday, November 12th. But like I was saying, we are going to get into the losers here in just one second. Top five losers this week from week 10 in the NFL. And we're going to start at number five. And this is a team that I talked about yesterday. It's the Colts. The Colts are at number five, and it has to do with the quarterback situation. I've talked a lot about this, and I still haven't found a reasonable explanation for what they're doing at quarterback. The Colts are a team that they're just fine. They're going to be around 500 all year long. And that's fine if you want, if that's what the Colts are going to be, but they clearly want to be a playoff team. They're not a playoff team. The way that Joe Flacco is playing ball, it doesn't show you that he should continue to be the starter, and yet now they've named him the starter for the third straight week. I do, I did, I did understand the benching of 
Anthony Richardson back a couple of weeks ago when it happened. It was a really bad look for him. He hadn't played his best football. People were all over him about it. He wasn't accurate. He tapped himself out of a game. Not a good look. I completely understand wanting him out of there at that point. But now two weeks later, when your justification was, Joe Flacco gives us the best chance to win. And I wasn't arguing then. They've lost two straight games. They've played awful. Joe Flacco, in particular, has played awful. They refuse to go back to him. And I don't know what the relationship is like there. I don't know the real reason, because I don't think they're really communicating that to the public or really saying why. Apparently, they didn't communicate it to Anthony Richardson, Anthony Richardson himself. But I've been saying this the whole time. The biggest weakness with Anthony Richardson's game, a well-known project quarterback, when he was drafted just last year, he's played 10 games in the NFL. A well-known project quarterback was his accuracy. And there's a lot of things you can learn on the bench in the NFL. You can learn how to read defenses. You can learn how to be a professional. You can learn how to handle a team and be a leader. One thing you can't learn on the bench is how to be more accurate. The most important thing with accuracy, not only is, of course, throwing with anticipation, but it's your relationship with the, with the receiver, the ability to know when they're going to break, how they're going to break, how fast they're going to be, where you need to put the ball, how, how much zip you need to put on the ball, all of these factors. And it only works when you get these chemi chemistry with the number ones, with the receivers. He's not learning that right now in practice. He's not going to get any better, and you're not going to know if he's the answer if he sits on the bench. The Colts continue to be losers. They are the number five loser this week. I don't understand what's going on over there in that building. Number four, it's the Texans. For whatever reason, in the second half, their offense completely shuts down. I know that offensive line is a problem, and for some reason, the offensive line tried to rip the foot, tried, tried to steal the football from C.J. Stroud. Not, not something I've ever seen happen before. Forces a fumble, almost turns the ball over in a very crucial spot, ends up making them miss a field goal on that drive because of it. That is not a good look for the offensive line. It's already struggling a little bit, and now you're stealing the football from your own quarterback, not get, letting them get out of a sack. I do not understand it. It's just a mess over there. That They're going to get Nico Collins back. Maybe that should help them. But right now, the way that they've been able to play in the second half of the last two weeks has been abysmal. They, they had five interceptions in that game, and they didn't win. You cannot be a serious NFL franchise, get five interceptions in a game, and still lose. I, I really don't get it. I really don't. But they found a way to lose anyway to the Lions, or maybe the Lions found a way to win. The Texans are a number four loser. Our number three loser, it's the Jets. The Jets are done. I'm ready to pronounce their season dead. I'm ready to read their re read read the read the eulogy at their funeral here. They're done. Aaron Rodgers continues to prove that he is not all the way back. I don't know if he ever will be all the way back. He doesn't seem like he's all the way bought in with the New York Jets, but they're stuck with him for at least another year or two. He might retire. I don't think he will. Everything that he's asked for has happened. They got Devontae Adams. They hired the coach he wanted. They fired Presu uh, uh, allegedly, they fired the coach that he wanted fired. They've brought in all of his friends. It has not worked. They rebuilt the offensive line. The defense that was so good last year has fallen apart. The Jets cannot get anything done. I don't know what's happened. There might be a curse over that team. But for whatever reason, Aaron Rodgers going to the Jets, his, his career is absolutely tanked, and the Jets have no future right now unless magically they can find a way to turn it around next year. They're all the way in, though, so they don't really have much of a choice. At number two, our number two losers, it's going to the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry Jones in particular. Jerry Jones, king of the castle over there. All the walls are starting to close in. Everything that worked last year seemingly falling down off this year. Dak Prescott, second in MVP voting last year, not playing his best, gets injured. They already paid him the biggest contract in NFL history. CeeDee Lamb, not the same receiver. They already paid him. You have the defense, incredibly injured, but also cannot stop a cannot stop a run of your nose right now. This is an absolute embarrassment for the Dallas Cowboys. They are playing like one of the worst teams in football, and to top it all off, they have, and this is something that if you've watched football for a while, you've known, the issue with the sun 
in Jerry World over there in in Dallas. It ca- it's caused them to lose a touchdown in the last game, and Jerry Jones refuses to admit that it's a problem. We all knew it's been an issue. We've seen it before. It's it's made its way to be known on in in playoff games, in many games in the past, but this is just a very, very obvious one. Having your star wide receiver not see the ball because of it. The Cowboys are the number three the number two loser, and they they just can't stop getting in their own way, really. And that leads us to number one. The number one loser of the week. It's the Chicago Bears. For the second week in a row, the Chicago Bears are the biggest losers. They cannot figure themselves out. They continue to shoot themselves in the foot, and I think it's the coaching. They've made a switch. We'll talk about it in their next in our next segment with firing the offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron. We all knew that one wasn't going to work out, but everyone seems to have checked out. Even Caleb Williams seemingly checked out, done with that coaching staff. It's not enough to fire just the offensive coordinator. Matt Eberflus needs to be gone. The Bears could not get anything going offensively. That defense played really good, but against a Patriots team to only put up three points is ridiculous. They need to be better than that. The Bears are the number one loser of the week, and I don't see any kind of sign of stopping. That's that's a new record. Two times being the number one loser of the week in a row. Not a good look for the Chicago Bears. But anyway, let me know what you think. Who are the biggest winners, the biggest losers of this week? Love to hear your thoughts. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we talk more about the Chicago Bears. They fired offensive coordinator Shane Waldron. We'll talk about what that means for their future for Matt Eberflus and the rest of that team. We'll be right back here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. 